This is an ABC podcast. Tonight, the energy market in disarray on the East Coast. Residents are told to turn off appliances as coal stations remained out of action and the global gas price soars. The proposed mechanism would see generators, including existing coal and gas operators, paid to guarantee supply to the energy grid. Last week, as householders worried about their lights and heaters staying on, AEMO took the dramatic step of suspending the national electricity market. Efforts to keep a lid on galloping electricity prices. Australia is rich with the resources needed to produce electricity. Coal, gas, sun and wind. So how did we end up in an energy crisis? You're not the only one scratching your head as you read your energy bills and hear warnings to urgently conserve. And now there's a plan to pay fossil fuel generators to stay on to avoid blackouts while we transition to renewables. So how did we get here? Why is our energy system in such a mess? This is Rare Vision, and I'm Sarah Allerley. To really understand what's happening, we're going back to the 90s, when Australia was one of the first in the world to privatise its energy supply. There was a series of reforms to try and bring more competition into the energy market. So instead of everything being owned by governments, we started to split up our transmission, our power lines, from our generation, from our retailers, to try and get more efficiencies. And for a long time, this was very successful. Prices remained very low. That's Joel Gilmore. He's an associate professor at Griffith University Business School. He also works for Herbidrola Australia, which develops renewable projects. Joel says the national grid ran into some challenges that we're still quite literally paying for today. Governments started to become very concerned about blackouts, not due to running out of power, but just because the poles and wires on our streets were a little on the old side. And so we invested very heavily in those networks, the poles and wires. Overinvested, in fact, often referred to as gold plating. This happened in the 2000s, but unfortunately this infrastructure investment didn't factor in the change that would be needed to move from a few coal generators to lots of small solar and wind generators. More on that later. The thinking here was that somehow you would get market forces and the benefits of competition and the innovation that flows from that working on the side of the consumer and working on on the side of the economy. The conclusion is, well, how did that work? Pretty bad, uh, hence the security crisis we're in now. But the story is interesting, and I think a lot of the big decisions that were made in the 90s and then the noughties about the kind of market that we have now are important because they tell us what we need to be thinking about now as we look to design a market that will actually withstand the conditions we're in and be something reliable for the future. My name is Dan Cass and I advise the Australia Institute and the Clean Energy Investor Group on Energy and I'm an associate at the University of Sydney Business School. Dan says our energy system has been overcomplicated by privatisation. So yes, it's not just you struggling to understand it all. The regulatory bodies really have this fetish of market purity. They would rather spend, in some cases, years and years debating how to have this kind of perfect... Euclidean geometry of market design, this kind of perfect system of instantaneous trading and co-optimization of different factors that are fed into a, a, a single algorithm that is the dispatch and pricing algorithm that decides exactly what's traded in this wholesale market. And it's really pretty crazy. What we need with the electricity system is simple reliability and some price control and planning. And compare it to an essential service that's simple and easy to understand, like an ambulance service. If someone said we need to have a complex market where you could bid for ambulances and different ambulance companies could bid to provide the ambulance and manufacturers would bid into that market to provide different kinds of beds and intensive care equipment, you'd shortly pull the plug on the conversation because it's crazy. It's an essential service. When you need it, you need it. You just want to know it works and it'll be there. Professor Tina Solomon Hunter blames the influence of Thatcherism and Reaganism on Australian politics in the 90s. And of course now we're seeing that the market, which was the national electricity market, which is controlled by AEMO, Australian Energy Market Operator, 
has had to suspend the market in order to guarantee supply. So what we see is that the market's allowed to run until the market fails and then the state steps in. I'm a professor of constitutional law and energy and resources law here at Macquarie University, and I'm also the director of the Centre for Energy, Natural Resources, Innovation and Transformation at Macquarie University. There's got to be a different balance, and I think the balance is, is that we have the government sets the parameters and then the market operates within that so that there is, but there is a clear parameter of what it is that we're trying to accomplish, which is in this case energy supply. Once you sell off an asset, of course, you have no control over it. There's been this reacquisition. The classic example is Snow Hydro Electricity um, Scheme, which had been divested from the Commonwealth. And in 2017, 2018, it was taken back into the Commonwealth fold. And of course, the Commonwealth through Snowy Hydro is actually building uh, a pumped hydro energy storage system to be able to provide some sort of battery storage. So I think it's as we go forward and build new infrastructure and, and engage in new projects that the role of the state should be increased again. So privatisation created the national energy market, often referred to as the NEM. And it's this NEM that had to be suddenly taken offline recently by the body that runs it, the Australian Energy Market Operator. But did the NEM do its job in the past couple of decades? Overall, I don't think that the national electricity market has served us terribly well. Bruce Mountain heads up the Energy Policy Centre at Melbourne's Victoria University. It started with great fanfare. And in its first years, I think it worked pretty well. Prices were quite reasonable, they were quite stable. But the wheels started to fall off when we started to embrace the transition to clean energy. And this market which had been created was found to be unable to provide adequate investment signals. So one of the main reasons you'd have a market is not just to operate assets better, but to provide investment signals for new entrants to come in and bring on new generation. And this market has not done that well, partly because it's an extraordinarily complex market, partly also because governments have chosen not to bring within the market the single most important factor that drives the change or is needed to drive the change, which is a price on carbon. And having failed to do that, um, the market itself uh, and its players could not bring about the transition needed. Now we're, we're left with a very fragile market. We didn't think about renewables impact. Certainly there was no discussion until 20, not that I know of, until 2014, 2015. I think we've been caught short with a number of generators going offline and I think that the NEM needed to be reconfigured much sooner. So what is it about the NEM that could have been changed previously that would have allowed renewables to have stopped this from happening? So the NEM is based on the idea that the vast majority of our power comes from power stations, coal or gas-fired, and then we allow renewables to come in. So what the NEM needs to be reconfigured is that renewables have equality of access. So couldn't the argument be made then if we had prioritised renewables, you know, had them come on faster but also sorted out the NEM so that renewables were able to play a bigger part, that we could have avoided this current crisis? When companies designed their generation plants, they designed it on being the preferred power supplier up until the time of closure, so say 2030. So they based all their economic modelling on the fact that they were going to be dispatched first into the market until 2030 at whatever percentage. So you're going to take 90% of their power, say. If you then inform them, well, actually, we're redesigned the, the NEM and now you're only going to be 60%, and that has serious implications. But it wasn't just the failure to prepare the national electricity market for different types of power generation. We also failed to price carbon. And there was a worldwide delay in accepting the need for new energy sources. Here in Australia, that failure was an overt refusal and a denial in the face of science. If you're old enough to remember seeing Al Gore's film An Inconvenient Truth, it might be slightly shocking to realise that this was 16 years ago. 
In 2006, the former US vice president and presidential candidate released his blockbuster film. It featured a sort of slideshow he had toured the world to educate people about what was then called global warming. After this, Australia began what some call the climate wars. This is a major factor in the backstory of this energy mess. There's kind of two opposing forces, if you like, in Australian energy. Energy and climate policy has been dominated for three decades by the polluters, and they called themselves the Greenhouse Mafia, and they have scared successive governments off doing the right thing. That's the negative. And on the positive, Australia is the inventor, significantly, of the cheapest energy source in the world. Dan Cass is talking about rooftop solar. And this is really the silver lining of the crisis that we're in. That if you like, we've had the sort of devil on one shoulder saying, dig it up and ship it out, the fossil fuel lobby, and the angel on the other saying, here's the world's cheapest ever supply of energy in rooftop photovoltaic solar. Joel Gilmore says when Australia turned climate change into a partisan political issue, we got distracted debating the science instead of getting on with fixing our energy market. It's unfortunate that we haven't been able to really start debating what's the best way of doing this. We've given up on some of the best solutions, which would be a broad market for carbon emissions. We apply a price on carbon and then we hand that money back through lower taxes and we let the market sort it out. I think we would all agree that that is the most efficient outcome. That ship has probably sailed. Bruce Mountain says Australia's stop-start energy policy has created a vacuum. And that stop-start is seen in coal-fired generators which are on their last knees, but not enough clean energy and storage to take its place. And how is it that our government has so little power over energy systems that they actually built? I fear our government's have been much too influenced by sectoral interests, in particular coal and gas-fired companies and the companies that use coal and gas. He says this corporate influence led to the disbanding of the carbon tax and has left a legacy of energy supply problems. I think our policy response hitherto has been much too haphazard and half-baked. I think that's changing now. I sense a great mood for reform right now. But Bruce says a price on carbon is no longer essential. Governments can have a policy to reduce emissions. If they're not willing to apply the stick of carbon prices, they can apply the carrot of payments of various forms. It is essential that they do that because the transition needs to happen far more quickly than will happen in the status quo. Yes, wind and solar is cheaper than coal and gas, but it's going to come in uh, gradually as wind and solar farm developers perceive coal and gas is going to leave. This is Rear Vision, and I'm Sarah Allerley. We're looking at the backstory behind why our energy system is in such a mess. Back in 2011, energy prices soared, and there was a lot of debate about how to shore up supply. So what happened or didn't happen in the past 10 years, other than neglecting to price carbon? South Australia is in the dark this evening, following a statewide blackout after major storms. Authorities say the severe weather damaged infrastructure, which caused the system to shut down as a safety precaution. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The The focus of the parliamentary fight today was energy. It's coal. It was dug up. The reliability of South Australia's power supply has been questioned. What do I mean by fair income? Stuff that works when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. There, that's the reliable power. But this suggestion that wind and solar create unreliability in the electricity system is being challenged by the Grattan Institute, which has analysed power outages over the past 10 years. And the linking of blackouts to renewables is really not accurate. The market operator says the intermittent nature of wind energy wasn't to blame. The settings were on the wrong setting, so it's a software issue. It wasn't the nature of the generation. The federal coalition government tried to use the 2016 South Australia blackouts to slow down renewables across the country. The crisis that we're in now is really because we are heavily reliant on these coal power stations, which have been increasingly unreliable and most recently, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, incredibly expensive. 
Joel Gilmore says we should have bought insurance so we were less exposed. We could have brought on that battery or indeed that gas power station had it there ready to go to replace the coal when needed. And what would that insurance look like or what what could it have looked like? The simplest, the blunt force approach is the government goes out perhaps for an auction and says, who could build a new power station? And what we'll do is we will cover your costs for the first few years because we know you're going to be needed sometime in the next three years. And as soon as you're needed, then we release you into the wild and now you're a fully-fledged member of the market. We would have been saving an awful lot of money if we'd had some cheap replacement capacity ready to go right now. But to run a gas-fired power station as insurance, you need access to affordable gas. There's another policy that everyone I spoke to said the government should have done in the past 10 years. Reserve a portion of our gas for domestic use. If we had planned ahead 10 years ago we could have set up a situation where we could have leveraged that domestic gas to help us through this crisis. We have still the opportunity, indeed, we will continue to transition, close our coal and, yes, build a little bit of gas. Australians own just 4.3% in the companies extracting and processing natural gas across the country, according to a new study by the Australia Institute. The research reveals the companies making super profits from the gas price spikes are sending most of the dividends offshore, while households are left with the escalating energy costs. If someone said to you, why are we sending gas overseas in an energy crisis? I just don't even get it. What would you say? I agree with you. (laughs) That would be the first thing I would say. In 2001, commentary was made, there will be a gas shortfall in 20 years if we don't do something about it. Five years ago, a colleague and I wrote a paper on this saying that there was a gas shortfall and we had an energy security problem now, let alone in the future. We're doing a number of things all at once. We're trying to set up a a new national electricity market on the East Coast that will take into account different sources of energy, plus we're trying to make up for gas shortages, plus we've got generators going offline quicker than predicted or than scheduled. And then the thing that really crippled us, which not many people are talking about, is the fact that Snowy Hydro couldn't drop enough water to generate emergency effectively hydroelectric power because Blowering Dam is full. And because of that, Tumut 3 couldn't generate because they couldn't drop the water to generate the electricity because they would have caused widespread flooding. So it's, you know, this this coalescence of, of events. When you say that a gas shortfall was predicted around 2001, what do you mean? Because there's not actually a, a shortage of gas, right? Like we have, we're exporting gas. Yeah, so we have a certain amount of gas that's needed in the domestic market. All of the coal seam gas in Queensland, you may as well completely discount that as a source of gas because none of that has been earmarked for domestic use. It was all for export. Not only does the benefit of that fall to the companies that that are exploiting that gas, but also, don't forget, this this is our gas for our use and for our benefit. Because the government is the custodian of the natural resource that we, the people, own. Look at Western Australia. 30 years ago, Western Australia said that gas needs to come to us first and then what's left over can go to export. And the East Coast and the Commonwealth and, and the states have allowed is that the gas can go to export first and the domestic, us second. That thinking needs to be turned around. And if we do that, then we're not going to get into the crisis that we are at the moment. So a domestic gas reservation is the answer, and we need to look west to see how successful that has been. The energy crisis Australia is experiencing this winter is the climax of a bunch of events. Russia invaded Ukraine, which meant its usual gas and coal exports were removed from the market. Australian mining companies could then get high export prices, driving up energy costs for us at home. Then we've had cold and a lot of rain, old generator maintenance, and everything fell apart. Bruce Mountain says the other element at play has been our culture of electricity production. There isn't a sense of social licence in the industry. I don't feel the industry has worked together to pull out the stops to keep the lights on. 
Would this have happened or a version of it if we weren't still so dependent on coal and gas? No, absolutely not. Uh, It's that we simply need them so desperately uh, that we are here. This is extraordinarily frustrating because as one economist after the next will tell you, we've got this fantastic advantage in wind and solar production. And we simply have not exploited those fantastic resources at the rate that we ought to. We've been fiddling and faffing, frankly. I think we've had a crisis not just in crazy prices, which I fear are going to start to flow through in a meaningful way at a retail level and impinge on the livelihoods of many Australians. We've had the prospect of the lights going out or shortfalls. This is just completely unacceptable in the day and age that we live in with the energy of various forms that we have. Nothing Putin does and nothing a war does and nothing the international market does can ever affect the flood of sun and the flow of wind across our continent, which will power our economy in the future. So if we get this right now and if we work out how to use the market and what's left of it to our advantage and direct investment where we need to go, this will be the last energy crisis Australia ever has to face. Do you think somebody could have made that statement 10 or 15 years ago and, and could, like, how predictable was it that we ended up in this situation with the decisions that were made? Yeah, look, that's a great question. And I'm doing some research on this and I'm not going to share yet because I think it's a blockbuster. I'm going to be calling <laughs> Netflix and saying, let me do a doco. Um, yeah, I think it was all predictable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got US government reports from decades ago predicting learning curves that were pretty close to what happened, which said we will get to grid parity between clean energy and dirty energy. It's just a matter of time. I mean, we've really got the world's leading PV researchers have been saying this for probably 20 years. It is inevitable that clean will beat dirty. It's just a matter of how quickly we want to get there. Do we want to let it happen slowly in a disorganised way or do we just want to grab the, you know, grab the bull by the horns and ride it and just drive those prices down? If Australia had really doubled down on our natural advantages 20 years ago, building solar and wind at scale out in the, in the regions, you know, large-scale solar and wind, and also really doubled down on that rooftop solar miracle in the suburbs around the country, we could have avoided this crisis. We could have kept prices lower. Our electricity market depends currently on coal for about 60% of supply. So in the last 12 months, about 60% of energy is coming from coal, about 34% from renewables, including within that about 10% from rooftop solar. There is no doubt that as we get closer to 100% renewable energy, our system will be vastly more resilient economically and also physically. Earlier, Joel Gilmore explained the gold plating, over-investment in poles and wires. He says what we missed was upgrading our large-scale transmission grid, the part that brings power from the generators. And we've perhaps been lax in building new lines to unlock those new resources, the resources of the future, those incredible wind and solar resources, particularly in our regional communities. And we are now frantically trying to do that. It's also something that 10 years ago, or even five years ago, if we'd started planning and investing then, we would have access to more options right now. So what have we learned from this crisis? And where to from here? We can keep the system stable and secure and affordable as coal retires. We just need to redesign the market mechanisms around that. But the way it's been done is so complicated, I think there's a case now to return to a much more simple and much more interventionist role for government where governments just decide what resources are needed, procure them in, probably from private providers or it could be from National Energy Commission-style organisations, and then we just get it done, we get it built. Joel Gilmore has looked at recent plans for a capacity market that would pay all generators, including coal and gas, to be available when needed. This is to avoid a repeat of what just happened – The spot market was capped due to high prices and ultimately suspended. 
after some generators refused to supply energy because they couldn't get the prices they wanted. So the current idea is that all generators get paid a flat fee in exchange for a promise to turn on when asked. But Joel has an alternative idea to the capacity market, a capacity reserve market. It's hard to see how paying people who are already here, paying them more money, does anything than cost consumers more money. In contrast, a capacity reserve market is where you just pay a little bit of extra capacity. If we think we need one more power station as a reserve, we pay that one power station. And that's a much lower cost and much lower risk. You have to ask, how much more do we need to pay our coal generators to do the right thing? Another idea often floated is a super tax on gas and coal exports to fund a faster transition to renewables. In Norway, what's happening is part of the, they have this sovereign wealth fund that comes from petroleum taxation. And it's used in part to build up other parts of the economy. So they're making transitions to wind. So the idea is, is that we keep producing, but we also use this as a, an opportunity to use monies coming from, from oil and gas projects to build new networks. So, for instance, when we build Snowy 2 pumped hydro energy storage, we're going to need all new transmission lines. The UK call it a windfall tax. But why do we even need gas if we're transitioning to clean renewables? Gas is a very important transition fuel. It's not that you replace coal power stations with gas power stations because the emissions from gas are actually still pretty high. Gas is very valuable as emergency reserves for those hottest days in summer or indeed for those times where the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Having gas operate as a few percentage of our power seems like a really sensible way forward. But that doesn't actually need an awful lot of gas. Some of my research shows that, yes, you know, somewhere between 92 and 98% of your energy coming from renewables with a little bit from some sort of fuel. Now, that might be gas, and particularly in the near term, but there's also hydrogen, there's green gas, biogas, these other fuels. It's not clear that the answer is relying on fossil fuels, that we have to maintain giant pipelines for something that's only used a little bit down the track. Baseload power has often been a reason cited for needing gas in the mix. But this technical challenge has now been solved. The last, I guess, objection to letting coal go, this is the maintaining of the frequency and voltage in the NEM. That was really the last technical hurdle, and I think it's been fixed. So uh, Australian researchers have demonstrated what's called grid-forming inverters. It means that batteries and solar and wind could kick-start the NEM like a jumper lead, if you like. If it falls over, they could boost it up into power and keep it running at the right frequency that everything works. That really is the last piece of the technical puzzle. I think now what's needed is policymakers to procure in, to buy large amounts of storage in particular. Even with storage backup, large-scale renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels. And this has been found time and time again by modelling here and in markets around the world. And the tipping point for new clean versus old dirty was probably five or six years ago. For more information about our guests, please head to the Rear Vision website. The sound engineer for this episode is Bella Tropiano. I'm Sarah Allerley, and this is Rear Vision. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.